All right, let's go ahead and open up to Romans 11. Romans 11, and we're getting in the final section here of this, the chapters 9 to 11. Uh, let's just remember right up front that this section has nothing to do with individual personal salvation. Paul already covered all that in the first eight chapters. Very thoroughly, very completely, that's all done. And uh, now what he's doing in chapters 9, 10, and 11 is he's talking about the, his change, his dispensational change uh, for going from Israel's prophetic program to the Body of Christ mystery program. That's what, he's going, that's what he's going to be doing here. And now we're in the final section in chapter 11. Chapter 11, uh, make sure we understand God is not all done with Israel. Uh, verses 1 through 11, he gives all these reasons. Uh, he's not all done with Israel. He preserved a believing remnant. Why would he preserve a believing remnant? And he preserved it in, their, in the scriptures uh, for the future believing remnant uh, to pick up on uh, in that tribulation period. Why would he preserve a believing remnant in their ministry if he wasn't going to return to Israel? Why did, he, why did he stop dealing with Israel, stop interacting with Israel, set her temporarily aside uh, while she's still uh, partially blinded, partially uh, hardened? And uh, why would he do that if it's only partial and hardened? Because he's going to return to them and he's going to enlighten them. There's going to come a future Israel that is going to believe and that he is going to uh, receive them and they're going to receive him in faith and he's going to usher them into that kingdom and he's going to fulfill what he says here at the end of verse 12 in Romans 11. He's going to bring in the fullness of Israel. He's going to complete his prophetic program with the nation of Israel. Uh, and you see the section we're in now is going to be bracketed by that. At verse 12, he talks about the fullness. He's going to complete his prophetic program in the nation of Israel. And at the end of our section, go down to verse 25, and we see he's uh, going to uh, end, that, the end the section. He begins the section with Israel's prophetic program, and he's going to end the section here at the end of verse 25 until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. He's going to completely fulfill his two purposes, programs, and, with, and peoples. He's going to bring to fullness, to completion, his prophetic program with the nation of Israel, and he's going to bring to completion, to fullness, his mystery program for the body of Christ. And that's what we, and then how everything in between there has to do with that. So God's not all done with Israel. And why don't we pick it up here? Uh, I guess we could pick it up at verse 12, which just summarize what we, uh, where we finished off last week. Where we finished off last week. Uh, God is not all done with Israel. God is not all done with Israel. Last week we looked at this. This is because of his, uh, what I call his Israel equation. He is going to uh, accomplish something through Israel. Here, let's read at verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more the fullness uh, he's going to bring to fullness. You see the logic he's using here. If, uh, the fall, if through the fall of Israel, God has brought riches to the world, especially the Gentiles, the idea here is that how much more riches there's going to be when he returns to Israel and fulfills his pro prophetic program with Israel. Uh, if Israel's temporary fall was the riches of the world, that's Pauline grace. We looked at that last week, so we won't turn there again. But I've, said, I've gone through this over and over, and hopefully uh, it goes by fast enough you actually remember it. It's the riches of his forbearance and long-suffering and, uh, and goodness and kindness, the riches of his grace and his mercy. It's the riches of he became poor so that we might become rich. Right now, God is dispensing his riches on that. And uh, he's putting that into effect. And if this all came through Israel's fall, just think 
what it's going to be like when Israel when he completes his program with Israel. It's going to be much more riches. Uh, for I speak to you, verse 13, as the Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, uh, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. He's talking to the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles in the light of Israel's temporary fall. Uh, and he's, he is magnifying that. He's bragging about that. He's boasting in that. He's not boasting in himself, but he is uh, boasting and magnifying in the ministry God gave him to do this ministry of grace to the whole world and especially the Gentiles. But, and this is the big but, he's going to go from here now into the, all the way down to verse 25, but he said that doesn't mean he's arrogant and that Gentiles should be arrogant against Israel because God's doing this program through Paul now. His magnifying his office, bringing the riches to the world and the riches of the Gentiles, what he's going to spend in the next few verses here now, he's going to explain, but whatever you do, Gentiles, uh, don't, this isn't a reason for Gentile arrogance. And we're going to see that as we go down through there. If by any means I may provoke to emulation uh, them that are of my, my flesh, um, for that he might save some of them, that he might save some of them. Yeah, when you're ready, when I'm ready, just hit that button, but it'll be a bit. All right, sorry, the, the, now the batteries have gone out on my clicker, so Cindy's going to be our, our official clicker. Uh, so uh, now in verse 15, he gives the second example of this uh, Israel equation. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? God's not all done with Israel. In, in verse 12, he said, if Israel's fall resulted in God's riches coming to the world, especially to the Gentiles, that's not a reason to think God's all done with Israel because uh, when, God's all, when God can, picks up his program with Israel, it's going to mean even more riches for the world. Verse 15, if their temporary casting away uh, resulted in the reconciling of the whole world, and of course if it's the whole world, it'd be mostly those Gentiles, a reconciling of the whole world, then isn't it obvious that when he returns to Israel, it's going to be life from the dead? See, what he, what we, the only way you can understand this passage and really understand its fullness, to use that terminology, is to rightly divide. Because what he's saying here is he's explaining if God's all done with Israel, then he's given up on the earth. He's thrown the earth into the, into the, into the pit. He's thrown the earth into the garbage can. Because the mystery program was not designed to fulfill, to fix, maybe that would be the better word, to fix the problems of the earth. Just think, we've been in Paul's, God's mystery program through the Apostle Paul and the body, for the body of Christ now for 2,000 years. And is the world, the earth, any better? No, it's worse. And if you read First and Second Timothy, you know it's going to get even more worse as it approaches the last days. It just keeps getting worse and worse. This mystery program for the body of Christ was never intended to fix the problems on earth. 2,000 years show that. We're just as bad now as they were then, if not worse, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. If God's all done with Israel, then he's given up on the earth. The mystery program through Paul wasn't meant to fix the earth's problem, and it hasn't for 2,000 years. The mystery program is meant to fix the heavenlies problems. 
Now he's come down to earth through his riches where men are born, they're born on the earth, and he comes and he's saving people to place into the body of Christ through the rapture and is going to take them up to the heavenly realm and they're going to participate, we're going to participate, the body of Christ in that mystery program in the fixing of the problems in the heavenlies. We're going to participate in the reestablishment of his glory in the heavenlies. If God's all done with Israel, then he's not going, to, he's, he's just given up on earth because there's no other provision for fixing the problems on earth. That comes through Israel and her prophetic program. If God's all done with Israel, he's all done with the earth. And that's why he brings out here now, if their fall uh, resulted in riches coming to the, gent the world, the earth and the world uh, and the Gentiles, just think what their fullness is going to bring. It's going to fix the problems of the earth. It's going to, in that kingdom we read about in Matthew, what's it going to look like? All the problems of the earth are going to disappear. 2,000 years uh, then right now in the mystery program that hasn't been fixed, but in God's prophetic program, when we've talked about this over and over in Matthew, when he's ready to usher them into that kingdom, they go into that kingdom, Satan's going to be bound. Uh, the, the, uh, the unrighteous, the unbelievers are going to be cast out. Uh, they're going to enter the kingdom. The righteousness of God and the knowledge of God is going to cover the earth as the, as the waters cover the sea. Christ is going to be reigning on David's throne in, in Jerusalem. Uh, every, the, the crops are going to be bountiful. The weather conditions are going to be perfect. There's going to be complete justice and equity. That's God's fix for the earth. 2,000 years under the mystery program didn't fix the problems of the earth. The mystery program and the body of Christ are designed to fix the problems in the heavenlies. That's what we're going to participate in. And when, when God's all done with this, he's going to restart his program with Israel. And it's going, to bring the, it's going to bring even more riches. It's going to solve the problems of the earth. And as he says here in verse 15, it's going to be life from the dead. What kicks off? Uh, the end, what, or let me put it this way, what ends uh, this, this uh, dispensation of grace? It's going to be that rapture event, right? And what happens in that rapture event? We could go to 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, we won't go there, but you could put it in your notes. And he explains the dead in Christ, the dead in the body of Christ are going to be raised up, resurrected from the dead. And those who are alive are going to be given their resurrection body at that time and be transformed and be taken up to, into the heavenlies, placed in our heavenly positions where we're going to participate in God's fix for the heavenlies. And that's a perfect system. But uh, once that's removed, that's the life from the dead. Uh, everybody who's died in the body of Christ is going to be raised from the dead. Those living are going to be transformed and taken up. Life from the dead. And what happens at the end of that seven-year tribulation period? Life from the dead again. There's going to be the resurrection of God's prophetic program, uh, Old Testament saints, Gospels period saints, uh, those who died in the tribulation period. They're going to be raised from the dead. And the, those alive at that time are going to enter into the kingdom. And what's another aspect of that kingdom? Longevity is restored. Life from the dead. And the nation itself is going to be resuscitated uh, from the dead. It's going to be life from the dead. If God's all done with Israel, then there's no hope for earth. 2,000 years under his mystery program didn't solve the problem on earth. In fact, the earth's problems keep getting worse and worse. They weren't designed to fix the earth's problem. They're designed to fix the problems in the heavenlies. When, he, when that's, he's done with that program, he's going to restart his program with Israel, and he's going to fix the problems of the earth. It's going to be life from the dead. He's going to establish that kingdom, and the whole earth is going to be governed and ruled according to his plan and purpose. The nation, through the nation of Israel, he's going to reestablish his glory in the heaven, excuse me, on earth. We're, through the rapture, are going to participate in the reestablishment of his glory in the heavenlies. 
So that's how important this is. Don't save. And now he's, he's dealing with Gentile arrogance. You Gentiles, just because God's doing something among you now, don't get the idea. Don't look down on Israel. God's not all done with Israel. He didn't pick you because you're a better group of people. Uh, he, he didn't pick you for anything inherent in yourself. He's just uh, set them aside temporarily. He's now calling out a group whereby he's going to fix the problems of the heavenlies. And when he's done with that, he's going to come back and he's going to restart his program with Israel and fix all the problems on earth. And now with that in mind, that's the complete program. That's the two programs. You have two programs, like two springs in a watch. Uh, when you have two springs in a watch and they're working, they're, maybe one's going counterclockwise, the other one's going clockwise, but they're two they're working in perfect unity, perfect unison, uh, but it's one watch. They're working together and it's one in, running one watch. That, and then you close the lid and you get the perfect time. Uh, that's the way the universe is going to be run in the fullness of times. It's going to be one universe. It's going to be a spring. Uh, the, our, the mystery program in the heavenlies is going to be running perfectly. His prophetic program of the earth is going to be running perfectly. And together, they're going to be perfectly running. And, and uh, the time of the universe, they're running the universe. He's going to be running it through that way. It's going to be a perfect provision a perfect, uh, it'll, so that the whole universe, uh, re, uh, re, in the whole universe, his glory is reestablished, shining out the way he intended it to. And so now with that in mind, what he's going to go to next here in verses, as we go down through verse 25, is he's going to attack Gentile arrogance. Don't let this mean, don't think as Gentiles participating in God, what God's doing among you today, don't get the idea that God's all done with Israel. Don't get the idea that you're better than Israel. Don't get the idea that what most of historic Christianity says, uh, that the church, the body of Christ has replaced Israel. That's all nonsense. That's all nothing. If any of those things were true, then God would be giving up on the earth because that's not what the mystery program was designed to fix. All right. All right, so, and so that deals with the casting away. Go one more. Casting away. That brings us now to our verses here in verse 16. For if the first fruits first fruit be holy, the lump is holy, and if the root be holy, so, uh, so are the branches. Uh, and so now the idea here, it's from the lesser, the, the lesser to the greater, or the, the flow that he's got in mind here. More of this kind of uh, what I call these logic equations. If the root is, uh, excuse me, if the, uh, if the fruit is holy, the first fruits is holy, then the lump of dough you make from it's going to be set apart for God's purposes, holy too. It's real important to understand before we go into these next verses what the word holy means. Holy uh, does not describe anything uh, within the, uh, the, person and th the person or thing itself. It's nothing inherent in the person or work, it's, uh, uh, the person or the thing itself. Uh, and that's where the first fruits are holy. That just means they're set apart for God's purposes. Uh, the same crop, uh, you might have a one farmer who sets it apart, he sends it, uh, the first fruits to the temple, and it's set apart for God. Another guy sells it at the market. They're the same wheat, the same barley, the same whatever it is. One's dedicated or set apart unto God, one's not. Uh, that's what all holy means, set apart for God's purpose. Uh, and, you, and if the root is holy, then the branches, the same type of idea there. Uh, any branch that gets its, it gets its life and nourishment from the root is going to be holy like the root. All right, so now with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and let's attack this section that, uh, as I said in my email, um, most commentators I've flipped through uh, said is one of his most difficult passages. And let's see if we can kind of put this together. So we have to remember a couple things uh, before we start.
a couple things before we start. And that is understanding a uh, couple things. What it means to be holy. This I kind of introduced this on the point before. Holy does not refer to some inherent property in a person or thing. It just means a person or a thing has been set apart for God's purpose. And let's just think about this for a second. You'll see why this is so important to understand as we go through the olive tree uh, analogy here. Uh, and he's going to describe these things. He, uh, holy is not a reference to anything inherent in the person or the thing. It's just something that's been set apart uh, for God and his purpose. Take the temple. It was full of clay vessels. It had clay vessels, gold vessels. They're the same clay vessels and gold vessels you can get out at the market. They're the same ones. The priest goes out and he buys clay vessels and, and gold vessels in the marketplace. He comes back to the temple and he dedicates it. He, he, uh, he sets it apart for God's purposes. He may wash it with water, sprinkle it with blood, do uh, whatever ritual was called for, and now it's holy. It's, it's not because uh, doing that increased the quality of the clay or doing that increased the quality of the gold or anything like that. It didn't change the inherent, it didn't do anything to the inherent uh, quality of the vessel. It just means it's set apart for God and his purposes. You go back to that uh, stand out in the marketplace and someone, some woman can come along and buy that same clay vessel and she's gonna use it to wash the floors or, to, or for wash water or a gold vessel and she's gonna take it and put it in her pagan, uh, in her pagan uh, shrine in her house. It's the same gold vessel, the same clay vessel. One is just holy. It's been set apart for God and his purposes. And the other is just, I guess you'd call it secular. It's not holy. And it's important uh, to pick up on that. There's all kinds of examples in, that, in God's word. Uh, it's in God's word. Let's just go to one very uh, famous one you'll all know. Go back to Exodus. Exodus 3. You are all the burning bush story and everything. Uh, the burning bush, Moses is walking by and the, the God starts speaking to him out of the burning bush and he turns to look. Uh, so let's just look at that a second and you'll see the kind of idea we're talking about here. This is Exodus 3. It's the burning bush story. Uh, and so I'll begin at verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why, this, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not near hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Now, there was nothing special about that ground. It's the same ground that a few feet behind Moses uh, wasn't holy ground. It's the same dirt. Uh, the same animals have come true, through there. Uh, it's the same uh, ground. It's the same bush that's on the, behind Moses out the other side. It's the same type of bush, the same everything. The only reason it's holy is because God was using it for his purposes. God came and used it at that time. It's holy. There wasn't anything special about the ground or the bush or anything else. It's just God uh, was using it for his purpose. Uh, behind the ground behind Moses uh, wasn't holy. Uh, you could trot on it with your shoes on. It's just what God, the area that God was working with. And the next day, uh, a bunch of shepherds come through there with their shoes on and their, their, their sheep coming over the land and God didn't uh, strike them dead or anything. The next day they walked right over. It's just at that time he was using the land for his purposes to convey information to Moses. And at that moment it was holy. It was set apart for his use. There was nothing inherently, that ground, that dirt, uh, the plants in that dirt 
weren't inherently different or better than any other dirt or plant. Uh, it's just that God was using it for his purposes. And we see that uh, all throughout uh, the Bible as we go through there. So let's go back to chapter 11. To chapter 11, and let's start reading down through here with that little bit uh, in mind. All right, so the second thing we're going to keep in mind as we go down through here is the, uh, a little tip I'll give you is follow the pronouns. Very important to follow the pronouns. If you don't follow the pronouns, you're going to get all messed up here. Uh, and just realize that the, the they and the them refer to national Israel and the Jews uh, and the Israelites, really. Uh, let's go look at verse Oh, pick it up. We could go back to verse 1 and see that they're talking about the Israelites. Uh, but let's pick it up at verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, forbid rather through their salvation and them to provoke them to jealousy. They, them, their those refer to national Israel and God setting aside national Israel's program. But there's another group he's going to refer to. Look at now down uh, at verse 12, or excuse me, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles. Now here's another group. Now he's going to speak to the Gentiles. And notice that's the plural, Gentiles. And he's going to be referring to the Gentiles as ye. Now that's one of the good things about our, our King James Bible uh, is that it does differentiate between the plural, plural you and the singular you. you. Our modern English, uh, we just say you. And we have to depend on context to tell us whether we're talking about they're going to be, the God's now just working with the Gentiles, blessing them directly. And you see this a couple different ways. Let's go over to, uh, I guess let's go over and you can see this. We'll start in Ephesians 2, really quickly go there. Ephesians 2, and you'll see the status uh, of this. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 uh, verse 11. Ephesians 2 verse 11. Wherefore remember, you're going to get the whole picture here, wherefore remember that ye being in, in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by th that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time in Israel's prophetic program, you, ye, ye Gentiles, were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the position of the Gentiles in Israel's prophetic program. They're out there. And uh, if they want to participate in God's the blessings, they have to come and get them through Israel. In God's prophetic program, Israel was in the place of, of direct blessing, and they would uh, extend them then to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would come to God through Israel. That was the only way. They were on their own out there. They were cast away out there. Uh, and now, uh, uh, cast away out there, and if they wanted to participate in God's things, they, had, they would participate in indirectly through the nation of Israel. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye, and who are the ye? Go up to verse 11, ye Gentiles, ye Gentiles, uh, who sometimes were far off, who in Israel's prophetic program were far off from God, now, but now, you've been made near. You've been brought near to God. He's grafted you into the place of direct blessing. He's working with you directly now. You don't need to be an alien anymore uh, and come to God through national Israel. Now you can come, God has, is working with you directly. He's brought the Gentiles near him. Doesn't mean every Gentile is saved. It doesn't mean uh, um, every Gentile is saved or everyone's uh, receiving it. We'll see that in the next example. But now where Israel in, her, in God's prophetic program had been um, attached to the olive tree where she received God's blessings directly, 
and then they sent them out to the Gentiles. Now Israel, and in chapter 11, he's confirmed that now God has broken out Israel from that position, and he's put the Gentiles there, and he's carrying out a work now among the Gentiles, and he's brought them near to himself. He's, uh, go, he's blessing them directly uh, through, based on the personal work of Christ on the cross, but they don't have to go through national Israel. Let's look at it again. On the way back to Romans, stop at 2 Corinthians 5. And here he goes in a little more detail. 2 Corinthians 5. Let's pick it up at verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. And you'll see the same type of idea. He's brought the Gentiles near. He's brought them into the place of direct blessings. He's working with the Gentiles now. And he's set them apart to be the recipients of his direct blessings. Uh, in that sense, made them holy. He's using them now. He's working among them. He set them apart for his purposes. And, here, and you see how he does it here in verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5.18, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us, that would be the believers in Corinth, he's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world. Remember what we just read in Romans 11? Uh, the riches, the fall of Israel resulted in the riches of the world, especially the Gentiles. God now through the personal work of Christ has reconciled the world to himself. Uh, that's the whole point. That's what I bring up probably almost every time I, I, I speak. God now is, is saving his enemies. For Romans 5, he's saving ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. He's brought the Gentiles near. He's reconciled them to himself so he can put them in the place of direct blessing. That doesn't mean everyone's saved because look at the next thing here. Uh, to wit, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye recognized, uh, reconciled, uh, that ye there again, the, the Gentiles. So God in God's, uh, through Christ's work on that cross, God has reconciled the world to himself. He's at peace with the world, which of course would be especially the Gentiles. And our ministry as believers is to go out, as he says here, with that ministry of reconciliation and beseech those Gentiles who God has reconciled to himself to participate in that reconciliation, to receive that reconciliation by faith. Those who are far away, he's brought in, and Paul's using that in the analogy of the olive tree, he's brought them into the place of blessing, he's reconciled them unto himself. The whole world is reconciled to him. He's at peace now. What's the whole purpose of Paul's distinct apostleship? Now he's dispensing his grace and peace to his enemies, his grace and peace to the ungodly, grace and peace to sinners. He's at peace with the world. Christ's work on that cross took care of all their sin, all that they had against them. It's unto all, as he says in Romans 3, but those who participate, in order to participate in it, you have to receive it, and that's by faith. And so with this reconciliation, he's brought the Gentiles and put them in the olive tree at the place of direct blessings. He's working with them. He's reconciling them to, he reconciled them to himself. And now he's giving them the chance to believe and participate in that reconciliation, to participate in that redemption, to, re to participate in his righteousness. Let's look at another example. I'll go back to Romans, Romans 3, and you'll see how the mechanism for how this works. Romans uh, 3, we'll pick it up at verse 22. 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, before we had reconciliation, here we have righteousness. A couple of verses from now, it's going to be redemption and propitiation. <clears throat> All those things now, he's brought near the Gentiles near, put them in the place of direct blessing, and he's offering them all these things now. It's, uh, and look what it says here. It says, and it's unto all. It's unto all. The whole world. And it's actually upon. It's actually participated in. It's actually received by those who believe. For there is no difference. He's, he's put them all together. Uh, and he's taken now, he's broken out, we go back to Romans 11, he's broken out uh, uh, unbe uh, the, the nation, unbelieving nation of Israel, the apostate nation, the accursed, he's broken them out of the place of direct blessing that they've held for 1,500 years. He's now removed them from that place, and now he, temporarily, and now he's, uh, now he's carrying out a work among the Gentiles. He puts them in the place of his direct blessings. He's reconciled the world unto self. His righteousness is, off, he's offering his righteousness to all people, all, the whole world. His redemption, his everything, the forgiveness, he's offering that to them all now. He's blessing them with that. And uh, the only way, and what they need to do to stand there, to stay there, is believe. And that's what he's going to get uh, go on to here now. So the olive tree is God's place of direct blessings that come through Christ and his work on the cross. In the prophetic program, God put the nation of Israel, saved and unsaved alike, just the nation of Israel was his uh, tool, was his vessel, may it probably be the best word, his vessel, uh, for uh, receiving his direct blessings. Uh, and the Gentiles received those blessings indirectly through Israel. Today in God's mystery program, however, God has removed national Israel from the place of direct blessings. That's that breaking out the branches and put the Gentiles, saved and unsaved alike. He's working among the Gentiles. He's blessing them. He's reconciled the world to himself. He's at peace with the world. He wants to bless the whole world, which of course would be especially the Gentiles, and especially the Gentiles. Okay. In God's prophetic program, God set apart his own nation Israel for his purpose. That's the idea, made her holy. It doesn't mean every single person in Israel was saved or righteous. It just means he was using the vessel his elected vessel is the, is the nation of Israel, and he had, for 1,500 years, he put her in the place of direct blessing, making her the recipients of his blessings through the root uh, directly. Uh, and, of course, all of his blessings are hinge on Christ and his work on the cross and to the Gentiles indirectly. In the mystery program, in the mystery program, God grafted the Gentiles. Now he's taking the Gentiles. He broke out Israel and he's putting the Gentiles in the place of direct blessing. Uh, not because of any inherent quality of their own. Let's see why he does this. And this is where, remember, we're at a, he's a, a rebuking uh, the Gentile who has the idea that they're somehow superior to Israel or the Israelites. And now let's pick it up here at verse 18. But uh, uh, boast not, verse 18, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root bearest thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. See, this is Gentile arrogance. God couldn't do anything with Israel, so he broke her off, and he put us great Gentiles in her place. He'll, what he couldn't do with Israel, he'll do with us. And, of course, this is the, uh, the error of most of historic Christianity, who says some things like uh, the body of Christ has replaced Israel. As if God is going to be able to do something he couldn't do with Israel, he's going to be able to do uh, with a bunch of sinner Gentiles. 
Uh, see, it's just Gentile arrogance. He didn't break them out because there's any inherent difference between the sinful humanity of the Israelites or Israel and the Gentiles and the Gentile nations. There was no difference. It's like the clay vessel in the temple and the clay vessel in the marketplace are the same clay. What makes them holy is one's dedicated to God's purposes and the other isn't. There's no difference in the clay. There's no difference in the gold. Uh, there's no di and there's no difference between the Gentiles as there is the Israelite. Uh, don't boast, you Gentiles. Don't boast. He, you didn't get in this position. He didn't graft you into the place of direct blessings because you're better than Israel. Why did he do it? Let's go to the next verse, verse 19. Excuse me, verse 20. Well, so why did he do it? If it's not because the Gentiles are inherently better or superior or more workable or uh, have a better, better uh, future or something like that, who are, who are more promising, verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken out, broken off. Uh, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Don't think that he's broken off Israel and put you Gentiles in that place. Don't have, be a Gentile with an arrogant, high-minded, boastful attitude thinking you're better than the Israelites. More promising. God can accomplish through you what he couldn't accomplish through Israel. Don't think that. The only reason this, what God is doing this day is broken, and the only reason he's broken out national Israel is because national Israel stopped believing. It wasn't because they were worse than others or you Gentiles are better than them or are more promising so God switches people. It's not because of any of those things. It's simply because Israel uh, stopped believing. And let's just add, after we've been through chapter 10, you realize it's a persistent unbelief. All those messengers God sent, all those things God did are going all the way back to Moses to try and bring them back to himself. They rejected them in persistent unbelief. So God broke them off temporarily and set them aside. And now he's carrying out another work and he brought the Gentiles and he's put them in the place of direct blessing, reconciling them to himself. And so be not, verse 20, high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not you. The original branches on that olive tree were the nation of Israel for 1,500 years. Now they've been broken out and he's going to put a wild olive tree, the wild olive tree of the Gentiles, and he places them, grafts them into the place of direct blessing. And he, this is a warning, this is a rebuke against high-mindedness, against boasting, against Gentile arrogance. Don't think you're in this position because you're better than them. Uh, you're in this position because you believed God's word through Paul. And you are in this position simply because of that. You stand by faith. Thou standest by faith, the end of verse 20. But spare, would, uh, don't have any other, th don't think about this. You who are inclined to think about Gentile arrogance uh, in, in line with Gentile arrogance. Because j just as easily, no, more easily, just as God broke off uh, the nation of Israel from the place of direct blessing, uh, because of unbelief, because she stopped believing. Well, God can even more easily break off the Gentiles, cut out the Gentiles, uh, and put them back where they were before when they stop believing. For if God spared, verse 20, then the natural branches take heed that he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell uh, severity, but toward thee goodness. Now God, Romans 2, 4, God is dispensing the riches of his goodness, long-suffering, forbearance, mercy, grace, 
Uh, all those things we list out uh, uh, quite often. He, they're the recipients of that. He's put them in the place of direct blessing. He's reconciled. He's redeemed them. He's, he's uh, uh, offering them to participate in his righteousness. The only reason they're in that position is because they've been believing God's word through Paul. But don't be high-minded. Don't think, don't be a Gentile thinking in accord with Gentile arrogance. Don't think you're better than them or you're able to stand on your own or you're a, uh, more promising uh, for God to work with. The only reason you're there is because you believe God and his word and uh, through grace and faith. And if you stop believing, if you become characterized per by persistent unbelief, God even more easily can cut you out and put Israel back in the place. Nothing to do with individual personal salvation. It's just uh, now he's working with the Gentiles and he can remove them when they stop believing, uh, when they no longer believe. When they no longer to respond to God and his word through Paul, he'll just cut them out, put them back out uh, in, the, in a wild olive tree, put Israel, graft Israel back in, and then the Is Gentiles will be back out where they were before in, her, in, in God's prophetic program. They'll uh, be not in the position of direct blessing. They'll have to receive the blessings indirectly through the nation of Israel. Verse, and that's if they leave the goodness of God, despise the goodness of God, the riches of his forgiveness in Romans 2, 4. And they, verse 23, and also if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. Uh, and graft them in. That's what I've just been talking about here. If the Gentiles are only in the place of direct blessings now because they've responded in faith to God's word through Paul, when they stop responding by faith in God's word through Paul, God will just cut them out and put them out back where they were before in Israel's prophetic program, and he'll take Israel and put her, graft her back in. And she'll be returned to her place uh, in the in the in her place as a recipient of God's direct blessings, uh, and we know who this group is going to be, don't we? From our Matthew study, it's that group of the believing remnant at His return. They're going to look on the one they replace, uh, the one they pierce, plead with Him to treat them gracious, graciously, and they're going to believe. And he's going to usher them in that kingdom and uh, fulfill his prophetic program with Israel. And it will just bring it up. And the Gentiles will be back out, wild olive trees, uh, who will be blessed through Israel and her rise. Today, he's using the Gentiles to bless the Gentiles apart from Israel and through her fall. In that kingdom, they'll be returned. He'll cut them out of the place of direct blessing, put them out back as wild olive trees. Uh, re-graft in Israel because she's, she now believes and uh, Israel will be the source of indirect blessings to the Gentiles. Verse 24, for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were graft contrary to nature into the good olive tree, that's what he did with the Gentiles, how much more shall these, which are the natural branches, uh, Israel was the original occupant of that olive tree uh, and for the God's reestablishment of his glory on earth. 1,500 years. It'll be so easy. If he did the hard thing of grafting in the wild olive tree, uh, it'll be way easier for him to graft in the original branches, the branches that belong in that tree. And then he closes, and this is where we'll close, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own uh, conceits. See, that's what this section is about. And notice now he changes back the pronoun, lest ye. He wraps up this diatribe, this rebuke. He's dealing with they and them, the nation of Israel. And he goes back to the ye, and he's, uh, God is now dealing with the Gentiles as a whole, the ye, the Gentiles. And then for these what, six, seven, eight verses here, he rebukes 
the Gentile who has uh, the mindset uh, of the arrogant, of Gentile arrogance, that they're somehow better than the, the Israel, that their gods are more promising. God picked them because of something inherently in their own composition as, as people. And he says, no, the only reason they're there is because of faith. They stand by faith. God makes them to stand. And when they stop believing, like Israel stopped believing, he'll just cut them out, put them back in the place of indirect blessing, and bring Israel back into the place of direct blessing and fulfill his plan for her. All right, we'll close with that. Uh, there's so many other things we could say about this passage. We'll probably spend one more week on it. Uh, but hopefully th uh, that began to make sense. And let's close with a word of prayer.